Now, recently on this program, we've been, we've been discussing what constitutes domestic violence and how that definition goes way beyond physical abuse alone. Now, think about things like placing limits on a partner's spending, dictating what they wear, secretly reading their text messages. All of these actions could amount to what's known as a pattern of behaviour that's coercive control. He gets the kids to tell him who I see and where I go. He complains that I don't call him enough, then that I call him too much. He gets into my email and deletes things, and he sends messages from my account. You're a useless mother. You get everything wrong. You're losing it. Now, that's a video produced by Scottish Women's Aid, which was instrumental in drafting laws in Scotland, criminalising coercive control. They came into force in 2018, and domestic violence experts have described them as gold standard. Now, a New South Wales inquiry is considering its own law and hearing evidence from those who've experienced coercive control directly. Some time ago, my kind and gentle friend was brutally murdered by her husband. His final act of control was his first of physical violence. My friend had been subjected to years of what I now identify as coercive control. For a long time, my friend, while regarding his behaviour as unreasonable and unacceptable, in the absence of physical violence, did not perceive it as abuse. I was continuously monitored, financially abused, psychologically abused, controlled and manipulated. The fear, the confusion, the isolation, the struggles were all part of a grand plan by the perpetrator. The courts sent him home to re-offend on numerous occasions. The police weren't educated on the complexities of how his mind worked as he manipulated them as well. I lost everything I'd worked for. While many are clearly suffering, some police and legal advocates are cautioning against making comparisons with Scotland's experience, suggesting a new criminal offence could overburden already stretched services. So we spoke to the Chief Executive of, Scot of Scottish Women's Aid to find out what it takes to make laws like these work. Does the new law allow for the system to respond to more elements of the abuse that children and women are experiencing? And the answer to that is emphatically yes. Actually, I was in a meeting uh, just last week where one of the prosecutors was, was laying out essentially what the police say to the prosecution service when they say there was a crime committed and this is what we think it is. What this prosecutor did was indicate all of the things that would never have been able to be charged in that case prior to the implementation of our new law. And that was about 80%. And it was some of the most horrifying things about controlling the everyday uh, lives, micromanaging the everyday lives of, of the women involved in the charges. During the year between the time the, the act was passed and implementation, all of the, the sheriffs and judges in Scotland were trained about the new law and course of control. Um, thousands of police officers were trained and some of the, that is still going on. There were many, many, many things happened. The Crown Office did special training for their prosecutors, etc. cetera. Um, all of that needs to keep going. The reality is that there's so much evidence that says a one-off training doesn't change behavior. People know things differently, but they don't act differently. There has been really concerted efforts by Police Scotland to improve the quality of policing around domestic abuse. You know, to move away from the, oh, it's just a domestic and if we separate them and, you know, take him down and drop him off at the pub then, um, or somewhere else that, you know, that we've, that we've done our job and we can move on to the real crime. And I was interviewing then, uh, the then, um, uh, Chief Constable of Strathclyde Police. And one of my questions for him was, what made Strathclyde Police, who are a real leader in this area, decide to uh, change the way it policed around domestic abuse? And it was a, I thought it was a really telling answer. He said, well, it's not like we woke up in the morning suddenly and had an epiphany. It's what the women in the community have been telling us for years and that and when we started to take a look at what explained the murders and what explained you know a huge amount of the crime 
in our community, you know, so much of the trail led back to domestic abuse. And so it became clear to them that actually it was their job. And along with a couple of other things, possibly the most important part of their job. Now, Vincent, this is something that you worked on for a long time in, in the area of domestic violence. And you've described before how in one single night you can have as many as 20 incidents that you might attend and all the stress that that can bring when you're a police officer trying to discern what's going on and making everyone safe. At the same time, that is an, a very much an incident-based culture, right? So if we're going to make a shift or contemplate making a shift where we're trying to establish patterns of behaviour over a period of time, which so many survivors say is more pertinent, what does that mean for police? First of all, it's going to mean more um, time investigating the crime, mm. but it's a retrospective crime. So the, the police will still go to domestic, arrest the baddie, take them back to the police station and charge them. But it means that, you know, in the weeks following, that the police have to go back and sift through all the records and it is going to be really labour intensive and it's going to be very costly to the department, the police department, because they've got finite resources. But that doesn't mean it shouldn't be done. Mm. It will need a degree of education for sure, but I think with a lot of changes within the police or law, it will change over time. It will become a normative part of police work where it will just be automatically done. Mm. But it is very labour labour intensive. Do we have the resources for that? I mean, we know that this is the majority of police work, right? Yep. 60, is it 60 per cent or so in New South Wales? I've heard reports of 80 per cent in, uh, in, in Victoria. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah, it was between 700 to 1,000 domestics in Australia per day. Right. Yeah. So that's a staggering amount. So mm. it, it's going to be labour intensive, but even if it saves one life, yeah. it's worth it. Absolutely. And there's, there's no reason why it can't be done. I've read a, a number of articles um, on the New South Wales parliamentary website. Mm. It says that there's you know, pause for thought about implementing this. And I was gobsmacked. Why would you pause for thought when one woman is murdered every nine days about domestic violence? Mm. Well, the New South Wales police were, were kind of saying there's need for coercion, not coercion, sorry, for caution, mm. um, because of, you know, the low prosecution and conviction rates in other in other places? I, I, don't, I don't swallow that because it's been in Victoria, it's been in Tasmania now mm. since the mid, uh, since the late 2000s yep. and I dug out a report from the Tasmanian police. Yes. So since 2008 this, to last year, there's been 253 charges of coercion against offenders. Mm. So 253. Now, that is telling in itself that it actually does work. Yes, it will take time to implement. Yes, it will take resources. Yes, the police will need training. Training. And I'm interested in this too because I was looking up some of the things that police in the UK are now trained to ask. Um, is there anything your partner asks you to do that makes you feel ashamed? What is the first thing you think about when you wake up in the morning? And do you think there will be consequences if you defy your partner? More of a kind of a hostage entrapment situation. Yeah, it is. And... The police will have to go back through, and I've written some notes here, back through um, SMSs, you know, mm -hmm. WhatsApp, um, Facebook, Instagram, um, emails, phone records, and that's going to take time. So even if the offender, uh, sorry, even if the victim doesn't want to, or, or for whatever reason, um, is hesitant to look at it or to, mm. to comply, there's really nothing stopping the police going and mm. gathering those records and introducing them into court. What the good thing... Sorry. No. Yeah. No. What the good thing about the law is that the behaviour of an individual now has been is um, isolated, it's, it's been siloed, where before it was used to explain the ultimate offence of assault or domestic violence or murder. But now, because it's been isolated, these individual um, incidences are themselves part of an additional crime. Right. So, again, sorry. Right. No, 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 I want to ask Kerry your view as well because I know that you're involved with Our Watch. Yeah. And they too um, have, you know, expressed support for the need for, a, for a, you know, examination of this closely but also concern about some unintended consequences. Yeah, look, I think one of the concerns, particularly in the Indigenous community, is that mm. there, there might be unintended consequences for the Indigenous community because there's... You know, there's there's 
the, the rates of domestic violence within domestic in indigenous communities are higher than in the mm. broader community anyway, but there are concerns that these laws might work against the interests of women in those communities. So what our watch, you know, my my position as Which a is an director, advocacy group for domestic we're, violence. We're, we're an advocacy group for the prevention of domestic violence. Yep. And so I think the you know within the organisation, the fact that this is being talked about, anything which raises awareness of the types of behaviour that domestic violence involves is always is a good thing. Mm. You said at the beginning at your introduction that it's mm. you know people think it's about the fact that he he slapped her mm. or he you know he, he mm. took a you know, a knife to her or he killed her. It's actually more, much more than that. It, and women do live in those situations for a very long time. Yeah. And one of your quotes was from a woman who said her friend was killed and that was the first act of violence he'd actually used against her friend. Yeah. So I think the fact that we're talking about it is a very good thing. I think we need to make sure that anything we introduce, there's absolutely no point in introducing a law which can't be enforced. So, totally I, you know, if we if we are to introduce, you mean if it, there's low rates of conviction, if, if there's, there's low if, rates, if of there's not enough, at all. Yeah, if there's not enough ability to investigate, if there's not enough mm. to take it through the courts, if, or you know, and if there's not the resources that women need to be supported through those processes. Yeah, but th but that that was those arguments as well were also used when um, marital rape was criminalised. Oh. They said, we'll never be able to track it down. It's between husband and wife. We'll never be able to get enough evidence oh. and there'll be low rates of conviction. No, but, but and there have been. Yeah, I don't there actually, are low rates of conviction. It's I don't still not a law that, that works perfectly. But would you, but you know what I mean? When, would you I now don't say... Dispute, I don't dispute that this behaviour is t takes place. Absolutely. I, you know, we all know too many cases where it has taken place. Um, the only problem I would have would be, as, as you heard from the Scottish example, yeah. you know, we must make sure that when we introduce these laws that they just don't sit on the books. Yep. That's what I'm saying. I'm yep. not saying don't use them. Yep. I'm saying, you know, just don't pass laws and have them sit on the books. If you're going to pass these laws, then I think there needs to be the commitment from governments and police services and everybody else to make sure that they are effectively um, introduced and then used. That's what I'm saying. Yep. HJ, you've advised governments um, on, on this very issue. How do you think we should be approaching it? <clears throat> yes, I uh, have been listening to the conversation and um, yeah, when I came across this this morning, coercive control, look, it's important to identify it as part of the pattern of abusive behaviour. Uh, I myself have experienced um, domestic violence, uh, the phys very physical forms of DV. Uh, and so I understand why it's really important um, to have laws in place. Now I've I've dealt with a lot of police officers. Some some great. Some um, <laughs> had a lot to be desired. Mm. Um, some that have come in and just after I've been strangled said there was no evidence to take it any further because um, that was usually the main way that I experienced DV. Um, you know, and it's funny because in America, crimes like strangulation in the context of DV are seen as attempted homicide. But I'm highlighting this as an example that we already have that in our criminal code here in WA. And yet what happens afterwards? So say you get a really good cop who rocks up, who's really compassionate, understands everything, um, does the interview, does the police report, presses the charges. The real battlefield is in the courts. Mm -hmm. And I'll be very honest with you, we currently have judges and magistrates on the benches making decisions who either shouldn't be there, should be trained a lot more, or training is ineffective, or they're resistant to training, because there's something about DV and the psyche, the psychology, the impact, the PTSD, it's very complex. Mm. For women like me who understand it, we get it and in some ways we probably recognise it really intuitively um, and the solutions are probably more apparent to us um, than to others. So my question is, if we've got finite resources to beat this, mm -hmm. then does this become, you know, another distraction? I'm not diminishing its value, maybe it's symbolic power, mm -hmm. um, but in terms of um, practicality, on the ground solutions, I think about the children who are impacted Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, Aisha. I always get triggered. Oh, God, this wasn't so meant to happen. Sorry. Yeah, of course. We'll just give you a it's all good. Um, no. You know, I just get fed up yeah. because this talk is it really saving lives? Tell me. All mm -hmm. this debate.
you can create 10 more offences. But what happens when it gets legally prosecuted or you don't even get a fair chance to get a legal advocate or there's not enough legal aid funding, let's put the money where it actually makes impact rather than creating laws and live in this illusion that we're actually saving lives. Let's get real. Let's look at local solutions. And I know it's all about evidence. We need to have that evidence. But I want to know what happens at the pointy end of town. Mm. Um, because there are all of these pressure points in the system and there's an entire system failure here. Mm. So we're doing all the talking, which is fantastic. Meanwhile, someone's getting killed or by this time next week, we've lost about two more women. And there are children in our communities who suffer for decades because we haven't identified the correct solutions. And yes, I'm from the legal profession and I can tell you right now, they have a long way to go. Aisha, does it give you any... I completely get what you're saying. We do, we, you know, like, in terms of domestic violence and all the things that need to be done and there's no simple answer and resources are needed. And does it give you any comfort that this is something that so many kind of survivors say will help identify perpetrators better if it's not incident-based and that if we look at what's happened in um, Scotland, for example, there's been an 81% conviction rate um, and 95% haven't even had to go through the, the court system. They were, they were, they were settled, um, which means that a lot of victims don't have to get re-traumatised. Um, does that even indicate to you that that could be a good way? I know, I know we're just talking about it at the moment and, and that's what we do. Are you talking... Are you asking yeah, me I'm this asking question? You, Asia, yeah, I'm asking you, Yeah. Um, um, look, I think that's promising in a lot of ways. Um, However, I'm just wondering what that does on a, on a daily basis. I'll give you an example. Um, I, I work at the grassroots level where um, there are lots of people I know who've also um, experienced and survived domestic violence, not just as women, and there are men as well, but um, particularly with the children. Often, if there is a VRO in place, often it's the woman that removes that VRO. Um, and a lot of people don't understand why. There are lots of reasons. It's another conversation maybe for another show. Yep. Um, but it does happen. A lot of women refuse to press charges. Hey, that's the father of my, my child. Um, there's all kinds of reasons. A fear of safety, of repercussions. Often there's re reconciliations. You get trapped in this cycle. You can be a really strong woman. Like I consider myself, you know, back in the day when I was a teenager, I was really feisty. And then one day you just wake up two years later, you don't even know who you are. And you're, yes. you know, Know, your family's fault, but it's it's difficult. Sometimes it's women who intervene in that process themselves. Right. So when Kerry was talking about you know emphasising prevention, that's really important. It's also the support throughout the process. It's about getting the right legal help as well. Yeah. So I think the resources can be directed better in all sorts of areas. It's right. it's and women's refuges, another thing. I mean, where do you go for safety and right. trust? Yeah. Um, it's interesting what you talk about in terms of symbolic change as well and how do you get a shift in a conversation. Are some people saying that's happening in England and Scotland and Wales? There have been more publicity um, uh, of you know, coercive control cases and more discussion around it. You know, a lot of people saying now there's need for wholesale cultural change and this is something that FKA um, Twigs, I think, really highlighted when we talk about the need for cultural change in the way we talk about and understand domestic abuse and she was asked recently in an interview about her experience of abuse and she said this and nobody who's been in this position likes this question and I often wonder is it is it even an appropriate question to ask mm -hmm. and you know the question is why didn't you leave yeah and I think we just have to stop asking that question I know that you're asking it like out of love but like I'm just gonna make a stance and say that I'm not gonna answer that question anymore because the question should really be to the abuser, why are you holding someone hostage with abuse? You know, and people say, oh, it can't have been that bad because else she would have left. And it's like, no, it's because it was that bad, I couldn't leave. So that's a, that's a huge shift, isn't it, Sally? The number of times, even as, it, as I've reported on cases of domestic violence, it's almost the number one question people ask me. Why don't people leave? Instead of understanding how, people, how 
women particularly, because it's usually women in this situation, can be in a situation they feel they cannot leave? Mm. And I think, I think this is a, a really important part of this conversation um, that the nation is hopefully having around coercive control and emotional abuse. Um, because until, you, until you've experienced um, that kind of abuse or until someone you love has experienced that kind of abuse, um, it can be very difficult to understand what it is and, mm. and that um, difficulty to understand is what leads to questions like, well, he didn't, he didn't hit you, did he? Or, well, why didn't you leave? Mm. Um, or why do you keep going back to him? Um, I think... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I really sympathise with a lot of Aisha was what Aisha was saying around, you know, it's just talk, it's just talk. Um, but what I do hope um, is that by talking about it, particularly on platforms like this, that, um, you know, there'll be people watching at home who hear the message that you shouldn't feel afraid of your partner um, and, and you shouldn't feel like you are walking on eggshells in your own home. And, and those are the sorts of messages that accompany conversations about the technicalities and the specifics of what emotional abuse is and what coercive control is. And I think the more we talk about this, um, the more people will realise that they're in these situations. Because it's very common for women to not realise that they're in emotionally abusive situations. Um, mm -hmm. Hannah Baxter, for instance, um, she didn't, she told her parents, she didn't believe that she was in an abusive situation. Mm. Can I, well, can I just say that, I mean, you know, we talk about cultural change and that has to be the number one thing that we're aiming at in this space, which is why our watch does the work that we're doing, which is about prevention, because we will not stop domestic violence until we stop men and women understanding that there are no designated roles. You know, boys don't do this, girls don't do this, men don't have a natural superiority because they're bigger more, you know, they're bigger and, and faster and quicker. We need to have a community in which we absolutely believe that gender roles are not defined by male and female, that they're defined by, you know, what we do, what we need to do is have a community where we define ourselves as equals. Mm -hmm. And until we get to the stage where it is, you know, it is not acceptable for people to demean women. It's not acceptable for boys to make you know, smart-ass remarks about their little sisters. Until we get to that stage, then we will continue to have domestic violence because it is about recognising that the gender inequality still exists in our community, even in an informed, compassionate, open community that we like to regard ourselves as in Australia. Right. Um, Vincent, um, I, could I ask you to just quickly respond to what Aisha was saying and that kind of really strong sense of frustration? I think when you respond... To respond to domestic violence socially or even within the police, I think victims look for different triggers to... Um, to relate to or try to pull themselves out of that relationship, that there has to be a suite of measures because people identify with different aspects of, well, I need to do this or I can't do that. I, I don't think... It's, it's, it's not a, a one-size-fit-all um, response to for victims at all. What I might respond to will be different from what, you know, you or Alicia might respond to. So... <sighs> There's so much, to, oh. so much to do on so many levels. I just want to say if you need to um, support, call Lifeline on 13 11 14 or 1800 Respect on 1800 737 732. And